My name is Ambar and on behalf of a suitable agency and Sundar Nursery, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome all of you to the very first session of Suitable Conversations at Sundar Nursery. At a suitable agency, our love for all things books has been compelling us to bring more literary sparkle to Delhi's winter calendar, to allow readers and book lovers to interact with writers in a beautiful setting where conversations about literature and books could take place on a lazy winter afternoon. In as much as COVID protocols would allow, of course. It is from that desire that the idea for this series sprang. And we are extremely grateful to Sundar Nursery for their enthusiastic support and encouragement in making this happen. Without their collaboration, this series would not have been possible. And so before we proceed to our main event, I'd like to call upon Ratish Nanda of the Aga Khan Trust for Culture and our wonderful co-partner to say a few words. I must say we are extremely grateful to for suitable for the suitable conversations to be held here. Uh, I work for the Aga Khan Trust for Culture. We've worked over the last decade and a half creating this space. Delighted that it's been used in this manner and Manu is here today. So wishing you all a great evening and hoping for you to all to be coming back often. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ratish. And now to the main event that we've all been waiting for. Award-winning historian Manu S. Pillay will be discussing his latest book, False Allies, published this year by Juggernaut Books. We'd like to thank Juggernaut Books for their help in facilitating today's event. Due to unavoidable circumstances, Ira Makoti will unfortunately not be in conversation with Manu today as originally planned, though she sends her best wishes. But luckily for us, Parth Mehrotra, who is also Manu's editor at Juggernaut Books, has very graciously stepped in to save the day. Thank you, Parth. Before we begin, a few words about Manu. Manu S. Pele is the author of four books of history, including most recently, False Allies, India's Maharajas in the Age of Ravi, Raja Ravi Verma. His first book, The Ivory Throne, Chronicles of the House of Travancore, was published in 2015 and won the Sahitya Academy Yuva Puraskar, and it is currently being adapted into a highly anticipated web series. And now, without further ado, I will yield this stage to Parth, and Manu. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Unfortunately, I'm not Ira Mukoti, and you're saddled with me, but I'm not going to be doing most of the talking, so please bear with me. Uh, this is my first book event in 20 months plus, and what a brilliant, brilliant setting. And it's lovely to be here with a brilliant, brilliant writer, juggernaut star author Manu Pillai. Um, I'm going to get right into it. Manu's book, False Allies, is about the princes of India in the age of Raja Ravi Varpa. And many people might be wondering, Manu, what's a serious historian like you doing in the world of frivolous princes? Aren't they just about orgies and luxury and bankrupting their kingdom? So that's the argument in the book, which is that they weren't just about orgies, just about uh, orgies and palaces and elephants and dancing girls. There was a lot more that was happening in the princely states. These were not just places where uh, rajas and assorted monarchs, you know, or princelings sat about doing what they wanted, uh, oppressing their people day in and day out. It was a bit more complicated than that. And the real question is, were the princely states interesting? It's not a question of whether it's good or bad. The question is, were they interesting? And I think they were interesting. They were interesting as political actors ruling over political spaces. And most importantly, when speaking of empire, we often assume that the British Empire was just British ruled India, 60% of the subcontinent. Whereas in reality, there was a whole 40% segment that was ruled by Indians. The British were their overlords, but this 40% chunk of India was Indian ruled India, with Indian rulers, Indian ministers, Indian bureaucrats and Indian subjects. So even any understanding of modern Indian history necessarily requires us to at least interrogate and find out what was happening in this 40% of India. And it was, as I found, extremely fascinating things that were taking place. Yes, there were Rajas who had their orgies, but I mean, to be fair, Lord Curzon went tumbling from one married woman's bed to another when he was a young man. He played tennis uh, naked once. It, eccentricities everybody uh, you know, has in their lives. Uh, to single out the Rajas as somehow holding a monopoly on uh, excess, a monopoly on extravagance, is, I think, unfair. Uh, some of them were bad and rotten eggs, some of them were pretty good eggs. Uh, we just lumped them uh, under that stereotype and covered up the more interesting story. And I think 70 years after independence, it makes sense to try and peel back those layers. 
and understand what was happening politically, culturally, who was in control, what were the power structures that were there, uh, which were the factions that, that uh, played a role in court, how did the relationship with the British uh, progress or decline over, over different periods, uh, how did individuals matter? All of these questions are, I think, extremely important. It tells us more about our country rather than just chasing these uh, sexy stories about how many Rolls Royces they had and how many wives they collected and where they went on holiday and you know how they killed themselves drinking champagne, uh, which one Raja, by the way, did. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's more to the story than the stereotypes and the cliches that have completely blanketed our imagination. And these stereotypes, they serve the British uh, purpose of, of, of painting the natives as unable to move themselves. Yes, I mean, much of history, which we don't always think of, is also a battle of narratives, in that the empire, you know, there are different reasons, the different ways in which it spread across India and established itself. Uh, but all the same, there was narrative building that was taking place. And that narrative necessarily required the British to argue that natives could be power, especially the Raj, you know, after 1857. The natives were no good at governance, they were no good at ruling themselves, India wasn't, uh, Indians would not be able to hold the whole thing together, which of course continued even at the time of independence. That was an important plank. Churchill, you know, famously said Indians would never be able to control their own destinies. So that was an important point. In British rule India, it was easy for them to say that because they were in power. In Indian rule India, because there were Indians who were actually governing, who were actually in power, naturally they had to be belligerent. So the Maharajas could never be fully modern. They were all post-modern, even the best of them. They were all post-modern. They were not, they would never conceive that these men were men of modernity and men of the future. Uh, the Maharajas were not seen as political actors worth respecting, even though many of them were quite impressive figures. Uh, they were always seen as these tropical exhibits who dressed up in fancy silks and jewelry and and sort of posed for paintings, and that's all they did all day long. Whereas often, in fact, it was the British encouraging them to do that. And when Maharajas did not dress up, the British would be upset to the extent of Sayyid Rao in 1911 being told that it was seditious that he hadn't come wearing his Baruda diamonds and his British decorations and the whole you know, uh, thing that he was supposed to wear. So it was again far more complicated. Much of this was about narratives, much of this was about keeping a certain uh, idea about the princes going, and naturally this also means the princes found ways to resist it. They were creative, they were interesting, and they were able to fight back, sometimes in very subtle ways, sometimes very abusing ways, but always in some way or the other. And what were the ways in which they fought back? I think they weaponized ritual quite effectively. Yes. I mean, the, this is not in the book, but I was very amused when reading a record uh, at the archives in London where the uh, Maharaja Travancore was sent uh, a certain proclamation from the British, or a certain order. He didn't like the order, and he didn't want his people to know that he was being dragooned by the British into issuing these orders. So he said, oh look, you know, I'll get, I'll go to the Darbar and we have these orders read out, but can we just do the English order? And the British said, we see your trick, we know what you're doing. Uh, you just don't want your subjects to know that, you know, these uh, orders have come. So they said, look, the Malayalam order must be also uh, read out to your people. I just said, you know, he hemmed and hawed and finally said, okay, fine, we will insist, I have the Malayalam orders also read out. So he did. He goes to the Darbar, the English orders, right, the Malayalam orders, right. At the end of it, the British resident, however, writes back to Madras and says, the Raja is very clever, he got the Malayalam order read out, but he made sure all the Malayalis were absent from the room. He thought of made sure they were all out of the room and those orders were read out. Another one, often, you know, British residents and Rajas would fight over small things such as whether a, a resident would enter with his shoes on. Because Indians, when they enter, you know, important spaces, you obviously took off your shoes. And for the British, it was a point of prestige that, you know, they must walk in with their boots on. And this became a huge negotiating point in various states. In Hyderabad, it took two generations. The, Raja, the Nizam would not let go. Finally, there was a minor leader, a boy of two or three. And in his reign, you know, his Divan and the British came to a compromise. Divan got some, the Sarad done. And he sort of gave this much of a right to the British to walk into the bar with their, with their shoes on. Similarly, uh, the business of where the resident, the residence like the British agent in the bar, where his chair should be placed. Should it be next to the throne? Should it be, you know, up in the rest of the court? Should it be on the left side, on the right side? And the British who often lampooned the princes saying that these guys are so obsessed with rituals, they were very obsessed as well. Because they knew all of these rituals were not hollow rituals. Each of these things had political meaning. So the left side was the lower side, it was the inferior side. 
And in Bermuda, for example, the Maharaja would not allow the, the resident to switch to the right side because he said, no, you've always been on the left and that's where you can stay. But for British prestige, it was important that the, the resident switch to the right side. In Travancore, a uh, resident as late as the 1920s came and said that, oh, in such and such a state, the chair is next to the, the, the throne. Uh, why would we do that here as well? And the then Ramin said, absolutely not. You know, the, the, the chair has always been in where, where the rest of the court sits, not next to it. So you're not equal to uh, the prince who is in power. So it was, ritual was a means by which a lot of more subtle, a lot of more important and meaningful uh, political transactions were conducted. It was not all of it, it was not empty, and it was not because the princes were frivolous and, and did not, uh, and, and, and didn't have anything better to do. And ritual matters to this day, you know, when the current Prime Minister entered Parliament for the first time, the whole idea of him bowing before the steps of Parliament and touching his head to all of that, it was always meant to communicate something. It was loaded with meaning, or at least it was meant to be, uh, it was meant to carry meaning, but it was also symbolizing something. It wasn't just because he felt his head felt that, you know, had to touch cement to the ground. There was something more to it. And the same with the prince. There's uh, far more, there are layers to everything than may be obvious at a glance. So these were political acts, these rituals. Is that why you call them false allies? Because they were pushing back in ways big and small? I call them false allies because again, the narrative had two parts. One was, okay, we just can't govern, these guys are ideas, they're privileged and stupid, and we need to hold their hand and guide them uh, towards good governance. The other, however, was that the princes were also required by the Raj to sort of construct the Raj of old legitimacy. So in 1877, 1903, 1911, the three big darbars that were held by the British, it was important for them to line up these rajas, have elephant processions, and have them come and pay homage to the, to the British sovereign in 1911, and otherwise the Viceroy, etc. Because that ritual is important for constructing the British Empire's legitimacy. That they had replaced Mughal rule, and therefore all the other princes in India were bowing before them and acknowledging their, their supremacy. Uh, so they were therefore constructed as allies of the Raj as well, as pillars of the empire and so on. But in reality, they were very shaky pillars. They were not uh, what people uh, you know, thought they were. They often did find ways of resisting. It could be uh, little regional nationalist clubs like the Pune Sarbajanik Sabha. It could be giving Dadabai Nauruji, the East India Association in London, a grant, a Sukhajira Holkar of, uh, of or did, for 25,000 rupees, which was quite big in those days to essentially stand in London and keep saying things to aggravate the British government. Uh, it would be funding the Congress party. You know, the Maharaja's, Maharaja of Mysore in 1887 was told to stop funding the party, and this was an order that was that was given to a lot of them. But as late as 1900 or so, when Curzon interrogated the Baroda Maharaja, he realized he was still giving money. He was still donating to the Congress. Curzon, in fact, felt, he felt even in the late 1920s that a lot of princes were secretly financing the Congress because Naturally, they had an incentive to support, you know, my enemy's enemy is my man, yeah, his enemy is your friend. So that whole lot. And they would sort of, you know, find underhand dealings. When Sahaj Rao Gaikwad of Baroda goes abroad, he ends up meeting revolutionaries, Shamji Krishnavarma, Madam Kama, Savarkar brothers are linked to his guys. Uh, there's a direct link, you know, a close associate of theirs. Uh, seditious material is printed in Baroda. I think at one point they found that of, I think, 117 banned books in India, some 27 or so were published in Baroda state. And the Raja, every time he went and interrogated him, he'd say, oh, I had no idea. I had no idea this was happening here. And it was a pattern. In the previous century, in the mid-19th century, there were these dacoits in Baroda who get out of Baroda uh, territory, plunder British rule Gujarat, and then come back as the British police chase them, they would come back into Baroda. And the British police would enter with the, with, without the Maharaja's permission. And every time the Maharaja was, was sort of you know, asked to do something about this problem, he'd probably pick up one or two bandits and say, look, here are your people, off you go. Uh, the problem sorted. But in reality, he was less than enthusiastic about containing the dacoits and holding them back. Because he seemed to enjoy uh, troubling the British a little bit like this. Uh, sometimes it was also simply clever tactics. In Travancore, for example, they would have these government reports that would come out. A lot of the data was fudged, a lot of the data was exaggerated, and they would bombard the British with information on how many schools they built, how many canals they were constructing, how many roads had been developed simply to convey that, look, good governance is happening without your interference, so don't you dare come and interfere here, because we're already in control here. In Jaipur, it was different. Jaipur had a treaty with uh, the British, which said that any revenue is about, 20, about 40 lakhs, a, a certain cut would have to go, in addition to tribute, would have to go to the, to the British. So Ram Singh of Jaipur, for decades, kept fudging his accounts in a way that his revenues were always 39 lakhs, 39 and a half lakhs, 38 lakhs, and never, it never crossed 40 lakhs. 
And the British had suspicions. They knew that his revenues were closer to 60 lakhs. But he was just, you know, he modernized everything else. He built roads, he brought in, you know, street lamps and things like that. But he did not modernize his revenue collection because he did not want British access, the British had access to data. Nothing that they would immediately understand or easily understand. So as late as 1903, when his successor, Ram Singh's successor, makes donations to various British charities, there's an internal minute where a senior civil servant says that we know what he's doing, which is that he's essentially trying to bribe the British. He's paying them off little amounts in their charities, which is him saying, now you mind your business, don't come and look at my accounts anymore. So there were all kinds of strategies by which British pressure was resisted, it was questioned, uh, and, and often subverted, you know, by supporting anti-British figures or a window who wrote speeches for Sahaja Rao Gagwar and Baroda. You look at the collected four or five volumes of Sahaja Rao's speeches and you find always references to national government, national culture, national this, national that, that. And each time it would turn the Viceroy redder and redder. And of course, by 1911, they would, you know, try and push him off the throne. It didn't happen. Uh, so yeah, there were various ways in which different Rajas would find methods to resist the British. But one uh, some uh, if the lack of development of India is often traced to the drain of wealth, then surely forty percent of India was governed by these princes. Then part of the lack of development should be traced to them. There are of course noble states such as Travancore and Pereira and Mysore, which were extremely well governed, as you pointed out. But was good governance the rule, or was it the norm, or was it the exception? I and mean, it was the was the, the the stereotype of these princes tricked out in silks and satins like popping jays, and was that an exaggeration? It depends a lot on geography and you know, each region really. Because you find the South Indian states often did far better than the North Indian states, the Rajput states, for example. There was a, a huge gap between the two, but there is a conceptual mischief in the number of princely states that we speak of, which is 562 is the usual number that we have. Some take it up all the way to 700, some say 565. The number varies partly because it's always how you classify the states that determine the final number. 562 is a bit of a mischievous number because it lumps together every little zamindar, every little princely who rules over, say, five, you know, 50 acres of land and turns them all into rajas. Whereas, you know, they're not necessarily rajas. I wrote in an article recently that it's like comparing Queen Elizabeth of England with a country squire. You can't really put them in the same category. So then you're reduced looking at the major states, which basically means revenues of over, say, 10 lakhs, a certain amount of area, say 1,000 square miles. Things like that, a population, how many people live in the state. And then your number comes down to just over 100 states. And there is, that's the serious thing. Those are the entities that actually deserve the term Princeton state. And then you start looking at them, you start to hold on. Many of them did actively invest in, in governance. Many of them did water. Their rulers weren't necessarily uh, sitting about and lounging about doing nothing. Many of them quite early on conceded actual administrative power to their ministers. Maharaja of Kuchin, partly because of how large that family was in the uh, peculiar system of succession, for about 70 odd years, every Maharaja who came to power would be either middle aged or quite old. Uh, the final two Rajas were all cooling for two or three years and dying quickly after that. Which meant real authority was always in the hands of their divans, which is Indian statesmen were governing Indian territories. And the Maharajas of Kuchin were uh, scholars, they were you know, the big scholars of Sanskrit, for example. Uh, the Maharajas could be talked back to by their, by their divans. The, one of the Rajas wanted some fancy ceremony to be conducted, and his own divan said, No, this costs too much. You do it in your private money. State funds aren't coming to you, which meant a minister had the capacity to rein in a Raja's potential excesses in a state like Kuchin. Maharaja Gondar was a, a trained doctor, you know, who actually examined uh, patients and so on. So there were interesting characters even among the princes. Uh, not all of them may have succeeded at good governance, but many of them realized that good governance was important to keep the British at bay. A lot of the native statesmen, as they call them in those days, Sati Madhav Rahul, as Rahul Sagar has argued, produced what was India's first draft constitution. Why did he produce it in the 1870s? Because he said the princely state has spared the worst of British imperialism. If we design a basic template by which princely states can be run, they will not only survive into the future, they will out surpass the British, they will do far better. And there was economics also, which is that because the princely states are outsourced this whole business of defense to the British, the British by the end of it, so Tarampo, they were getting 8 lakhs in tribute uh, from the early 1800s. At that time, 8 lakhs was a sizable chunk of Tarampo's revenues. But with inflation and the passage of time, Tarampo's revenues by the time of independence was 9 crores. Whereas they were still paying 8 lakhs to the British for defense. So the, there was a big uh, gap there. 
So the British were saddled more and more with the passage of time with maintaining the security of the subcontinent, where the Rajas had spared that expense, and that money was often pumped into education. So when you say the princely states often had stronger social development in Dice, Mice, or Baroda Travancore, it's partly because they had the money. They were not they, they were spared a huge amount of expenditure simply by, and they were able to reallocate that to better things. Uh, Ian Copeland is studying how communal violence was less in the princely states. I mean, it should provoke a question as to why. Why was it that in the princely states, ostensibly ruled, most of them were these Hindu rajas, very orthodox and traditional and should, and they did consciously call themselves Tassud in the Hindu religion and so on. Why was it that communal violence for Muslims was lower than in British India? Because communal violence had a lot to do with the census, the way political uh, formations were taking place in British India. In the princely states, because they still had a paternal system of governance, paternalistic system of governance, it was still possible for a raja if it came to a situation where the riots were about to happen, he could still sit down community elders and say, look, we're going to hammer out an agreement and close this in a much more sort of personal way. And the Raja's authority would be respected. So there are interesting, you know, elements of it there as well. So all in all, I think, uh, you know, it's not just about good governance, it's also about asking questions on caste, communalism, identity, state formation, modern politics, a lot of things that we generally study when we talk about modern Indian history. But as I said, we only focus on British rule India and not on uh, on the states. And the states had tremendous diversity. Rajput states were ruled in a feudal system where there, there was the king, there were his vassals or chieftains who always tested his power. Then there were peasants, there were tribal groups, and there was British pressure from above. Very different from Travancore, which began to bureaucratize itself pre-British in the 18th century itself. Each state had very diverse conditions, which is why I chose five states rather than giving a general textbook. I thought you understand the diversity better by focusing on a select number of states, going in some depth into their story, and then uncovering what was happening there. And, and, and princes never had arbitrary power. Right? Even the worst of them never had the authority to just wake up in the morning and issue whatever orders they like. Uh, they could be checked by people in their own courts. Harris, the women in the court were extremely powerful women. Janabai of Baroda not only helped topple one Maharaja, she then tried to control the next, because she saw herself as a political actor. She didn't think her, her sphere was domestic and pujas and then the kitchen. Her sphere was also a political sphere. Um, the, I mentioned the Rajput uh, vassals who would often test the Raja. In Mysore, there were huge, there was a huge Virashaiva or Lingayat community and there were Bokaliga peasants and they pressed the court. Bokaligas and Lingayat are still essential to understanding Karnataka politics. So if you trace it back to Mysore, you may end up with a better understanding of why and you know, what, what the nuances of that, of that equation are. The Raja's power in Mysore was also checked by his own bureaucracy because the bureaucracy was dominated by Maharashtrian Brahmins who had come from outside the state and they were a power unto themselves. And Vishnavati Vadya of Mysore in the 1820s and 10s tried to rein in their, their influence. They ended up toppling him by conspiring with the British residents. So the Raja was ultimately pushed out of power. They enabled a rebellion. They tied up with the British resident and make the Raja look like a, an idiot and a villain, and a, a person who is not capable of good government, maladministration, misgovernment. These things are not necessarily what they seem at a glance when you talk about a princely state. So things are far more complex, even nationalism. The very fact that you read literature and the archival material on the states, you always find reference in Hyderabad to Mulkis and non Mulkis, which is North Indian Muslims being imported by the Nizam. And these guys in Hyderabad would say, these guys are foreigners, we don't want them. In my sort of for Buddha court, they would say that the Maharashtra Brahmins are foreigners. So the princely state, at a time of nationalism, hadn't yet fully developed. Princely states also tell you something about how that process took form, because this was the time when Indians looked at other Indians also as foreigners in some respects. They did not see themselves as people of one nation for the longest time, and it took an effort to construct that. And Ravi Varma played a role in that, but I want to come to that in a second. So. The, the, the princely states are essentially these little pockets of Swaraj and the better ruled ones, especially the native statesmen who actually did all the governing, must have been nationalist heroes at that time. Why did they ultimately fall out with the, with the national movement? So the native statesmen of the 19th century were meant like Sarti Madhav Rao, Shesha, Sri Raminga, Rangacharu of Mysore. Uh, as it happens, most of them are Brahmins. There's also an interesting thing about Brahmin domination public services, a debate that still continues. And um, these were men who had picked up the English language. The Marathi Brahmins were Deshas the Brahmins. They are actually a fascinating study because even from Tipu Sultan's time in Mysore, they were being brought in as, as professionals and bureaucrats. 
And with the coming of the East India Company, they picked up the English language. They were mobile. They were not tied necessarily to language. Meant they could go wherever opportunities arise, arose. And because of their Brahmin status, they were welcome in Hindu courts because they would get a certain amount of respect from the people as well. But because of their skills, they were also very efficient middlemen with the British. So they had given this peculiar position of power. Many of them were imported from the British service. So you have Sati Madhav Rao, he was originally a clerk in uh, the Madras government. Comes to Travancore as a princely tutor and ends up staying for decades and transforming the state. And the links between them are fascinating. His classmate, Shreshaya Shastri, comes after him and serves Travancore. Madhav Rao's son ends up becoming the one of Mysore. These are, these are networks of English educated Brahmins who are, on the one hand, they chafe under British rule in the British bureaucracy because they know there's a glass ceiling and there's only so far they can rise. And transferring their services to royal courts means that suddenly they have more power than they ever would have in the British service. In the British service, ultimately, you're a glorified secretary or an aide to a senior British official at best. Whereas in Indian uh, states, you end up having far more power and actually being able to do something. And the British have published this. They said, you know, there you are ruling your own country. It was, I do use the word Swaraj, I never used that in the book, but it was, in a sense, uh, a, a sort of enactment of that, even if it wasn't full Swaraj. There was some of that going on. And they, therefore, very curiously and interestingly thought about the future of the states. M.G. Ranade, even in British India, the nationalists were invested in the future of the states because to them, the states were not illegitimate entities. They were not entities that did not have meaning. They did see a cultural continuity between the past and the Rajas. And modernizing Rajas were even better because, you know, they were making an effort to also move with the times. So these statesmen thought about constitutionalism, they thought about democratic rights to their people over a period of time, they thought about Rajas reigning in their expenses and so on, yet maintaining enough tradition so that people were not culturally deracinated completely. There was a lot of interesting intellectual debate that was taking place. And most importantly, the moment a lot of these statesmen switched from British service to Indian service, they would start becoming a lot sharper in their, in their tone. So, uh, Shreshwai Shastri served the British service for decades, comes to Chalankur and suddenly becomes a major nationalist fighting for the Raja's right to try European uh, criminals, Raja's right to do all kinds of other things, say treaty rights matter and things like that. So, these were men who became nationalist icons because they were standing up for the British, they were helping the states assert themselves. But then why do the princes fall out with the nationalist movement? Because, you know, by the 1930s, because of pressure, so the Congress and the Princes were friends for the longer stretch of the freedom struggle. As I said, the Princes funded the Congress in, in, in large numbers. What was interesting is that by the 1930s, especially in the good states, Mysore, Chan, Kumbaruda, the big states that actually have education infrastructure, institutions being developed, etc., people naturally also read up about their political rights. They start clamoring for and demanding a uh, share of power. So it, it could be a seat on the Divan's Council, it could have to be representative of democracy, and, and so on. In British rural India, because of Congress's pressure, the British were slowly conceding certain rights. Uh, by the mid 1930s, under the so called new constitution, the British came up with. Congress was formed provis provis uh, provincial governments in, in, in Madras and other places by 1937. So by that juncture, princely subjects started looking at British India, where earlier the princely states were a kind of example, something to be celebrated by people in British India. Now the thing reversed a little bit, where princely subjects said, hold on, the British are now giving more rights to their people than you are. And naturally, when it came to it, the Rajas were unwilling to give up autocratic power. And they, they resisted that process. All the past reforms which were followed, which didn't really concede much to, to their own politicians, and there was growing repression as a result, because the politicians started agitating in multiple princely states, there were instances of violence. The, the so-called Jangal Mubala Bagh of the South took place in Mysore, at a place called Vidura Swatha, where the people were shot at. In Travan Kokuna Pravaina, where they were shot at. Uh, this was Rajas becoming more and more repressive. So the same Sardar Patel, who in 1929 tells the people of Mysore that your Raja is such a wonderful man, uh, if you're unhappy under his rule, there's something wrong with you, not with the Raja. By 1949, the equation changes completely, and Sardar Patel uh, describes the state of ulcers who must be you know, removed for the viability of the nation. There were other things also happening. Partition meant there was this huge uh, issue that took place, there was this huge shock that the country had gone through. They could not risk the states, uh, India modernizing, they could not risk the states potentially in future becoming platforms of secession or whatever. And therefore, a strong center was important, so the states had to go. And ultimately, most Rajas understood, and they, they signed on the dotted line, and Sardar Patel offered them carrots and sticks both. 
Uh, some of them, as we know, existed. Hyderabad being the most important example, where there was this police operation, uh, a very cute little term to cover up what was essentially an invasion with aerial strikes and so on. And there was a, a report after that, which has never officially been released, but you know, people have since published it, uh, unauthorized copies of it. And what's interesting is that that estimates that at least 28,000 people were killed. And that's why I think the states are also important to understanding communal relations, because the report argues that Sikhs who had just seen violence in, or partition in Punjab, when they came to Hyderabad, the Sikh part of the army uh, from the Indian side, the Muslims suffered. And the Indian government at least paid pensions to 3,000 people, so you know at least that many deaths were acknowledged. Uh, but yeah, it was a, a rather more chaotic affair than the term police operation in ways. Manu, tell us what does Ravi Verma have to do with this book? How does he come in? And also, you know, you gave us a glimmer of something earlier, which is about this um, the, the the North Indian versus South Indians in in Hyderabad. How does Ravi Verma help in creating a unitary national identity? Well, his image is famous. Well, in 1884, Satim Mazhara told him that you know your mythological works, you should start doing prints of them and be a service to the country. The idea of, of course, the very Hindu idea of, of the nation, but not, it was not communal idea or, or nationalism or religious nationalism as we define it now. They just thought that, look, this is a time when people have so much diversity, they don't connect with each other as Indians, uh, too many languages, too many costumes, too many food habits, and as I think Ramadeh's wife discovered, too many bathing styles as well. She went to a Punjab and she, Punjabi women were shocked that she would go into the water with a sari on, and they said, is this how you bathe in Maharashtra? She said, yes, this is how we bathe in Maharashtra. Uh, so, you know, even bathing styles were, were, were a surprise to other Indians. It's a very complicated country. Naturally, focusing on those elements of Hindu culture which could construct bridges and build something common. So, Ravi Varma's, you know, goddesses draped in the new kind of the sari, the, the kind of sari that everybody was wearing in Bengal and Bombay and so on, it was meant to communicate something. All his ladies wear high necked blouses, very Victorian, but you know, it was meant to build some kind of direct association with them. Uh, the prints were meant to construct a kind of visual imagery. And he was not just told this by Madhura, but even British officer, the governor of Madras in his speech in 1871, talks about how the national pencil must construct the national imagery and so on. And he just happens to be the person who does that really well. His press, uh, he had to sell it at a loss eventually, it, it bankrupted him. But in terms of what it achieved for the country, what it achieved in that process of identity formation, significant. But he. He's in the book for the simple reason that because there were a hundred big major states, I did not want to arbitrarily choose a few. I didn't want to be the one selecting which states I would study. And I realized this man firstly is descended from royalty, the Rajas of Bayport. He's related to royalty, his granddaughters and sisters in law were both uh, Maharani's of Travel Bob. He comes from that world, he's an insider. So just look at the states in which he's worked and you get a diverse set. Travel Bob, highly bureaucratized, highly westernized from the institution he's building. To the court in Tamil Nadu, ruled over by robber caste team, completely different system, completely different history. Baroda, ruled by Marathas, ruling over Gujaratis, very interesting foreigner outsider debate happening there. Rajputana, completely different from your oppressed town, Kogara, you are now You know, the Raja would not even speak English. He hated people who spoke English. He would, you know, there were Thikana, the chieftainships where the Raja, the chief would die and they'd have to, they'd have to adopt uh, a person to succeed him. And he would end up choosing the guy who did not speak English because he was against Westernization. Completely different character over there. So each of the states was interesting, each of them was unique, and I did not have to choose them. I just followed Ravi Varma. And structurally, I didn't want standalone essays. I wanted one common thread running through the book. And he supplied, even if it's a very slender, tenuous kind of thread, it's a thread. And to me, that was important structurally. So I think we're nearly out of time for our conversation and we're going to move to audience questions. But there's one question that I've been dying to ask, which is, who is the least likable British character in your book? Because oh, there are several. There are quite a few. I think Robert Fair, the British resident in Baroda, who accused the Raja of attempting to poison him. There was a big court case that took place. There was a huge inquiry. Uh, the result was split. The Indian said the Raja could not be categorically linked to the crime. The British side of the jury said that, oh look, we feel the opposite. And he was this, uh, Fair was this mischief maker. He was a man who came in thinking that the Raja must be inferior to me and he must consult me on everything. Uh, the Raja said not happening. So he and the Raja never got off uh, on the right uh, foot. And then eventually that relationship keeps worsening. But the interesting thing there is that Fair can't be blamed alone. As I said, the then, so the dynamics of the are interesting. There was a Raja, he dies. 
Raja has a 17 year old widow called Jamna Bai. And Jamna Bai, and this is a thing in the British in, in multiple places, know that in a lot of states, the moment a Raja dies without an heir, the widows have this interesting technique of declaring themselves pregnant because that then for a few months delays the question of succession and gives them some say and control over what might happen. It allows factions that go to realign themselves, come up with new equations, and prevents most importantly the British coming, the British coming and foisting some adoptee on them. So Jamna Bai does this at the age of 17, for the last three or four years of her marriage with the Raja, she hasn't been pregnant, but suddenly she gets pregnant. Uh, her brother-in-law who comes in and he's the other person cleaning the throat. He's upset naturally. So she starts sleeping with a dagger under her pillow with a dog tied to her bed post and cooking her own food. She's afraid her brother-in-law wants to kill her. Eventually she moves into the British resident's house and gives birth to her baby there. The Raja is waiting outside to make sure the baby isn't switched and a boy isn't a uh, wrong place of a girl. Uh, it's a girl, Tara Bai, Duravyorma Pains. And then the, the Raja says, fine, you know, I'm now finally uh, uh, becoming the Maharaja. Jamnabai does not sulk and sit about in the palace saying, oh my god, my god, no future. She doesn't become another heroine. She goes to Pune, which is where all the editors of the Marathi press are, all the big politicians of the day are, and she goes there with all her jewelry and a lot of money. And she starts spending her resources to sponsor complaints against the Raja in Baroda. So anybody who has a grievance against the Baroda Maharaja, come to the previous Maharaja's Maharani in Pune, she'll give you money, she'll help you complain. Secondly, this is the interesting way in which a lot of princes were even able to manipulate the British. The British often had illegitimate children, the British residents, which could be used against them. There was a resident in Taranko called Cotton. And even now, there's a Majali saying, bed till cut it in cotton or not, which is a way of asking, you know, have cotton been in your wife's bed? Because apparently he was a womanizer. Uh, so, you know, there were means by which residents could be held by the caller and, and manipulated. And Jandabai does this. What she does is, she starts using her financial resources to bribe even the resident staff, even his employees, to fan animosity against the Rani. As I said, resident fair already hates the Raja. Now with the Rani enabling a kind of, you know, uh, coup in the press, the press is against the Raja, complaints are coming in, his own staff is uh, bitching about the Raja, so on. So she's creating the stage for, a, for his deposition. Ultimately it happens, there's this uh, thing where fair comes back and says that, oh, I had my, my what was it, Sharta. And there was, there was this powdery substance at the bottom. The Rajas tried to murder me with ground, uh, the ground with uh, this thing, uh, diamond dust and arsenic. And it goes to trial, whatever. Eventually, they can't find anything against the Raja, but they still get rid of him. Jamna Bai comes in. And she helps, she, and the residents of the site by then, she helps the British identify a 12 year old boy, Sayadra or Gai Kwan and installs him on the throne. And this poor child, for the next six years, he bombarded lessons from the British on loyalty and how to be a submissive prince. He's bombarded from the other side by the Maharani on, because she wants to control him as well. Ultimately, of course, he comes to power and he's not controlled by either of them. And that's the final bit for power, where she says, she writes to the British two years after he comes to power saying, so far his self-sufficiency must not be to your liking, I don't like it either. You and I must rein him in now, and I must become the supreme authority in Baroda. This time, due to their own sexist reasons, the British don't go with the Maharani. And Sayyadira goes on to rule all the way from 1881 to 1939. Uh, and, you know, Jamna Bai essentially ends up taking a back seat, but it's interesting that even then she tried to manipulate the British and get them on her side. So, you know, your question was about which was the worst British character in the book, but he was bad, but I, I can't categorically call him bad alone, you know, because there are a lot of people making him worse than, than you know, a simple reading would allow him. I had a couple more questions, but I'm going to cannibalize your time if I ask them. I've edited this book, but it's always such a treat to listen to Manu tell you these stories. Um, does anybody have questions? Would you raise your hand, please? There is a reference to Sri Narayana Guru and uh, his association with Rani Ravira Manu. No, not in this book. Uh, Narayana Guru appears briefly in my first book, but not in all this book. Okay, so you talk about how these Rajas were showing resistance to the British rule and sometimes they associated themselves with the nationalist movement. But can we always associate that with them having a positive attitude towards their own public? Because one one type of imperialism cannot really cross out another type of imperialism, right? So even if they, they did have personal reasons to not like the British and to support the uh, nationalism, which actually said they stopped being at one point because their personal interest did come over. So just because, yeah, as you said, it's a very complex thing and there's a lot to be studied, which has been ignored. But yeah, what do you think about this? Well, I think in most of the big states that were held up as finding examples, even by
standards of living for the people were better. It doesn't mean it was perfect. It doesn't mean that somehow it was utopian. Gandhi called Mysore Ram Raja and Paul the Maharaja Ram Rishi and all that. But even Mysore, there was poverty, there was oppression, there was casteism. And Rajas, and partly because they did not have unchecked power, they would often hesitate to tamper with something. Mysore was a prime example. Because Rajas made this huge fetish of industrialization. They decided that we were going to sponsor dams, iron and steel work, all the big industries, because they wanted to show and demonstrate that natives could claim scientific pro prowess and technological prowess. But all the same, they hesitated to touch rural power structures. They hesitated to mix themselves up with the peasant caste and their politics because that could backfire. As happened in 1830, there was a huge rebellion because of the scene. Uh, the Raja was not popular with rural communities. So some of it was there. It's true that they were hesitant to, to go out and reform everything all at once. Some of them were good. Some of them were bad. Some of them, uh, the you know, the Udaipur Maharana who's in the book, he isn't toppled by the British themselves. What happens is that he uses his Rajput Nora for the longest time against the British. Ultimately, he's toppled by his people. The tribals and the peasant groups in, in Mewar, they stand up for him because his reign and the Rajput system was no longer delivering anything to them, it was actively oppressing them. That essentially threatened to fan out from Mewar into other parts of British India. That's when the British said, Marana, you have to step back now. So it wasn't as though these people were not questioned by their own subjects. Their own subjects questioned them. In Travancore, which was again one of these extremely well governed states, and I argue this is my first book, the Maharaja opens up temples to Dalits in 1936. He doesn't do this out of the goodness of his heart. He does it because the people demand it. The Yerva community, which had become extremely powerful, it had been energized by Sri Narayana Guru's uh, moral kind of message, uh, and it had, it had gained political influence. They threatened to convert from Hinduism, and the Raja felt, you know, I, I'm the ruler of a Hindu state, and if a 20% chunk of my population leaves, it will instead be a Hindu state. That is why he goes ahead and, and, and does the same entry uh, proclamation. The point is the people were not passive. So when we say that, you know, the Rajas were imperialistic or oppressive or whatever, it assumes at some level that the people were just passively receiving what they were getting, but they were not. In all these princely states, you find that the people had ways by which they could keep the Rajas in check. They could sort of, you know, counter any kind of pressure coming from above to the extent of even sometimes toppling the Raja if he was too oppressive. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, what was the actual military prowess that our uh, states uh, really had? And why did they fail at many different battles? Uh, is it just because uh, we were poorly organized? Or is it just because we do not have the latest technology when it came to weapons and arms? Uh, I, I, I really fail to understand sometimes how a population of 300 million can actually be colonized and ruled over by a few hundred thousand. Yeah, but you know that assumes that the population of 300 million thought of themselves as one unit. There's a wonderful book by Sujita Kavaraj called The Imaginary Institution of India. And it's a great book that constructs this argument of how Indian society saw itself as each community was a circle within a broader circle. And the circles did not merge into one united circle. They were each unto themselves, which means even for a lot of Rajas, sure, the East India Company is fighting with my neighbor. In future, they may come and swallow me up, but he still does not feel there is something in common with the with something that was happening in Punjab. Uh, you know, in the 1847-57 rebellion, Travin Kaur uh, would not have cared very much about what was happening in, in, in the north of India. There were some of those issues. The other thing is, it's not true that the Rajas did not fight. They did not have the capacity or the imagination, and it's true even in the 1930s. They were given opportunities to carve out space even in India's future. You know, potentially they could have had a space in post in India, but they failed to rally together and, and negotiate together with the nationalists and the British. But a good example is Gwalior, because Gwalior had 40,000 soldiers all the way to 1843, which meant it was a very strong state. When British residents came to Baisawai's court in the 1820s, for example, she would not go out to receive them. In fact, one resident arrived and discovered that no arrangements had been made even for firewood in his house, because she consciously wanted to put him in his place and say that, I am the queen, you are nobody. And you know, uh, she was able to do that because she had 40,000 soldiers. Now, the interesting thing is, what was the political economy of that state? In Gwalior, there was a huge opium cultivation thing going on. That opium scene, which the British were trying to check, was, was what was bringing in, in, in financial resources to maintain this large army, which meant the army became a power unto itself. So Baisawai was anti-British, but she was essentially, essentially and eventually chased out by her own army because they didn't like her. They conspired her and against her and pushed out this rather strong anti-British ruler and replaced her with a much more meek uh, figure. So each of these 
interaction between the states and the British is complicated. It was not one united force where the, the princes saw themselves as one unit who could potentially resist the British. Their cases were highly individualistic, and different states lost their military teeth at different points of time. Travancore lost it by the 1810s, by 1809, really, because there was a rebellion, the army was disbanded. Warrior only in 1843. Uh, different states at different times ended up losing their, their financial resources. It was not because, but the argument that you know, Indian rulers were somehow weak or their technology was backward, it's not quite true. If I'm not wrong, there's a, a scholar called Andrew Cooper. The name may be wrong, but he's essentially talked about the Marathas and how they did actually have access to technology. They did have armies that were far better in certain cases than even the armies of the East India Company. But it goes back to finance. By the late 18th century, maintaining these standing armies was a hugely expensive affair. And William Dalton talks about this in his book about how Indian moneylenders would lend more happily to the East India Company because there was a guarantee on returns, versus to Indian rajas who might say, Look, if you're troubling me too much, I'll hang you upside down and not pay your loan, uh, return your loan ever. So there was some of that as well. It's a slightly more uh, complicated thing than a, a, a simple suggestion that the rajas should have just united and, and fought the British. They didn't see themselves as equals. They did not see themselves as part of one united force. Some of them would be very petty. Uh, Udaipur Maharana often hated participating in British Darbars because he would have to walk behind the Maharaja of, of Baroda and Baroda were Marathas and Rajputs would not walk behind Marathas. There was something going on there. The Nizam would not sit with any of the other Rajas because he saw himself as the final representative of Mughal glory related to the Ottoman royal family and all of that. Why should he lower himself by, by talking to other princelings in India? So they never quite formed a united force, even when their own power and existence was threatened as late as the 1930s and 40s. Hi. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, all of your books are a uh, delight to read every time. And all of your I mean, uh, just before you came, you were just talking about that, yes, the books are brilliant, but I think it's a different experience to hear Manu tell the story. And uh, so thank you so much for that. And that's why my question also is that when you are telling these stories, and it seems so complex, right? But you are able to tell them like, you know, like a tale, like I'm talking about an uncle, and you know, you know yesterday this happened. So it, it comes, it's so seamless, and it's so, it sounds so simple. How do you do that? I mean, in fact, that's just the way I talk, I think. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's just that I think the idea that complex ideas can't be communicated in interesting ways is rubbish because it can be done. It's not all that tough. Uh, the book, you know, for some of it is also structural. So, when the book was being written, for example, I had to choose how far I would push a complex argument and how much I would put into the notes. If you're really interested in a lot of complexity, go to the notes because that all the complexity appears. I'm not saddled with required to make it interesting. It's, it's just data. It's not written in any fine sentences and, and, and wonderful prose. It's just information. If you're interested, you can find more reading. Uh, but, you know, other parts of it, I think um, a lot depends on how you structure a narrative, how you structure and build a chapter, uh, what instances you choose to highlight, and how you make your other argument. It's practice, I guess. You know, practice is, in any other profession makes you better. And, you know, four books in, I like to think that I have some time. Uh, my question is about language. Like, in what ways do you think language shapes us, shapes up our nationalism, and how language played a part at that time? I mean, there were so many languages in the country. So, did that have, uh, sort of, uh, did that have any contribution to the nationalist movement? I mean, it's an unpopular thing to say, but I think English was very important at that time to develop a sense of nationhood to begin with. To construct a moral argument and an intellectual argument of nationalism, the English language is important. So much so that the very first circular issued by the Congress in 1885 says that all participants and delegates must speak the English language, because otherwise you wouldn't have a common tongue in which you could negotiate and transact business. Uh, a lot of the political vocabulary that nationalists were using, ideas of very word democracy, terms like nationalism, it was easier to use that in English, it was easier to use that not only for their own goals, but also to appeal to people abroad. You know, moral case and an intellectual case of nationalism isn't built in isolation. You need to woo other people and get other people on your side. So, Priyamala Gopal has a book on, on people in Britain who actually ended up uh, supporting the Indian struggles because they were able to relate to what was happening. So English as a language was very important. Uh, all the same, I think the, the, the state languages, the regional languages obviously matter. Uh, what's interesting is how the archival record is arranged. 
you often find that a lot of day to day stuff, what is happening in the Darbar, you know, small things like that, would often be recorded, especially by the, the, the late 19th century, would be recorded in regional languages in the local language of the Darbar. But uh, diplomatic negotiations with the British, issues such as adoption, so things like that were always done in the English language because it was in dialogue with the British that those bigger sort of uh, decisions were taken. So there's an interesting play of languages there. Uh, some of the resource material was interesting to read. I found a lot of interesting material on Jamna Bai, who I described earlier, in a Marathi biography of hers uh, from about 120 years ago, a long lost, slender little volume. Uh, and you know, there were members of the Baroda family who hadn't heard these details before. So I felt very nice uncovering that. But yeah, languages is an interesting thing. But I think because a lot of the record is in English, and because a lot of these conversations were happening in English, uh, at that time, English was very important. So that's why the book is the age of Ravi Baba. He dies in 1906, and in many in, in many ways the book's narrative ends in that period before nationalism moves to mass politics. Gandhiji comes and he's able to use an Indian vocabulary, Ram Raj, you know, Indian concepts to appeal to a larger audience. But in the time nationalism was a more elite affair, the English language was very important. I think we're out of time now. So oh, okay, one last question over there, please. Uh, it's so interesting that you talk about uh, you know, uh, language uh, informing the concept of nationalism. Do you, and please feel free to refuse to answer this question. Do you think that's what's happening today when uh, there's a full push towards uh, Hindi and making sort of the concept of nationalism, especially in relation to the ideology of the class sort of more cohesive and moving the, the people of the two states of India, for whom many of whom Hindi is not the first language? I mean, the Hindi debate is well known, you know, there's, there's enough people discussing that. I only really say this much that because I also speak a lot in Kerala and I speak in Malayalam, engage with people in Malayalam, the same issues come to me and I, I learn a completely different side of things because that language in some ways, it allows for certain things to be expressed in a way that we in a kind of pan-Indian setting or on social media or whatever in English may not necessarily understand. The layers in which something works. Simple terms of which, frankly, there can be no translation in English, and yet that term means so much. You know, it encapsulates something that a villager is feeling. Because my, I have, I have you know, my family is, uh, we have a place in Kerala in a village. So I met the panchayat president, I met, uh, you know, a person who used to work for us, he's a panchayat member. So, you know, speaking to them in the language opens up all important issues, all kinds of fresh insights. Um, so I'm not going to go to the Hindi debate because frankly everybody knows and I'm not on the side of pushing any one language to become the language of India, we're far too complicated for that. Though Hindi is in a de facto sense becoming that, you know, everybody now seems to speak Hindi, except perhaps in Tamil Nadu, in a lot of places it's just managed to become, uh, to find a space. But in, I think the regional languages is important to really making sense of India, small things like, you know, the Shabri Manan, I was just telling you yesterday, the Shabri Mala judgment came out and you know the my ancestral village, the Panchayat president is from the Communist Party, which had decided that they were going to enforce the, the judgment. And she took the party line officially, but then private should go around the village telling everybody, I actually don't believe this. Please don't go in and, and, and support this thing because I don't agree with the party line on this. And it's because I could easily, you know, sort of gel with that Malayalam context that I was privy to all these conversations that were happening. And and conversations like this were not really being talked about in the English coverage of that topic. So I think in India, having access to your own mother tongue is, I think, important to, to make sense of a lot of these things. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all for being here. A special thank you to a suitable agency and to Sundar Nursery for organizing this. And of course, to Manu for entertaining us with all his stories. If any of you would like to get your book signed, there are no books for sale here, but if any of you would like to get the books that you're carrying signed, then Manu can sign them. Please just make sure that you keep your mask on and, and stay distance when you come to him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening and thank you for taking. Thanks, Father.